go to an F at the end, at the end. There are two choruses at the end, in between the two choruses. It's, do you have a section that says B flat, A flat, G, A? At least for bass. For um, guitar, it's just B flat. Um, Let's try Holy Holy, it's two verses, two in C, one in D. Yep, let's try that. All right, are ready? Is that holy, holy? Yeah? Okay, that's fine.
song as we sing this is amazing grace Good morning. Come on, there's a good crowd here this morning. We can do better than that. Good morning. All right, I want to welcome you to Thorn Creek Church this morning. Um, more than most Sundays, we don't all know each other. And um, some of us are here every Sunday about this time. Some of us are here because we love Andrew and Kelly, and let's be honest, Mostly it's Copen we love. I mean, he's just, um, he's really adorable. So some of you are here because you got into a van in suburban Minneapolis yesterday and you just 
when the leader said, get out of the van, you got out of the van and you're all here. Some of you came to worship in the gym and Nate told you to come in here. Um, maybe you're just exhausted from life and you're here this morning because you're looking for answers. You're looking for a way to understand life and to find solutions to what life is throwing at you. Um, but whatever you're doing here this morning, I want you to know that God is here. We're not just shouting at God from a distance. We believe because the Word of God teaches us that God is actually present in this place. And God has a plan for your life and a reason why you are here this morning. I want to invite you to sit down now for a moment, and then I'm going to have you stand up again in a second. But I do want to invite Chris up, and um, Luke, are you coming up? Um, we do have a group. This is convergence of multiple things. Um, we have a group from Prior Lake, Minnesota, which is outside Minneapolis. They are largely Vikings fans. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. Um, but they're not Packers fans, so um, yeah. Um, but uh, Chris is the youth director at this church, um, Friendship Church in Prior Lake, Minnesota, and he's going to just kind of give us greetings and let us know um, just share whatever is on his heart. And Luke is with Praying Pelican Mission. So there, there we go. Go ahead, Chris. All right, good morning. Um, as was stated, I am Chris, and our group is with Friendship Church. We are based in Prior Lake and Shakopee in Minnesota. Um, but don't worry, I actually am a diehard Bears fan. Oh. So... Um, and if we have any Packers fans in our group, um, we're leaving them here with you. Okay. <laughs> um, we are here partnering with Praying Pelican and several different churches in the surrounding areas to do a lot of um, just physical work, but also um, any opportunity that God brings for us to talk with people and um, have conversations to introduce them to Jesus or just encourage them in prayer. Um, we're looking forward to that as well. Um, any of the students that you see that are wearing the white shirts, feel free to say hi after the service, and we would love to talk more about our hopes and dreams for what we can accomplish this week. So also, we want to say from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for your hospitality. Um, it was a last-minute change, but we appreciate your flexibility, and God's teaching our team to also be flexible. So thank you. Hi, I'm Luke, and uh, I had the pleasure of staying here last summer. I think I was uh, actually the first PPM trip that you hosted, and I'm just glad to be back here at Thorn Creek again this summer and uh, get to be the last trip of the summer this summer. So yeah. uh, it's great to be here again. Great. All right. Um, Leah, you want to say something? You've been here a lot this summer, so. I mean, sure, of course I'll say something. Um, oh, no, that I've, might have been I a think, mistake. Go I, ahead. Think I've, I think I've been here um, the most frequently this summer, and Thorn Creek has become my own family, and I love coming in here and seeing all your familiar faces, and some unfamiliar because you're here for the baptism, but <laughs> um, I feel like I'm truly a part of Thorn Creek, and you all are so hospitable and welcoming, and I love your passion. Um, for welcome, welcoming us, and maybe you were unsure at first of like, okay, what are these groups doing here? But most of you have gotten to know me, and I've gotten to know you, and it's beautiful to see God's family coming together. And so I encourage you to just pray for Praying Pelican as, as we depart for the summer, but because next summer is going to be really fun. We're going to be here quite often, so you will see me again for sure. <laughs> okay. There you go, Pastor. Um, for those of you that are visitors, um, I just want you to understand what this group is. 
We have a series of groups. This is actually our sixth week of this summer when groups that have, co have come from Minnesota and South Dakota and Tennessee and Alabama and Minnesota again. And um, I don't know, I'm missing somebody probably. But they come here because they believe that God has an opportunity for them to do ministry in the Chicago area, specifically in the south suburbs. We have had um, almost 200 people um, involved in this this summer. And we have had an opportunity to serve in the name of Jesus in tangible ways. We had a great group here that was able to um, help people out after the tornadoes went through. And um, I was told, I've been told by several people outside of this church that, wow, people are talking in this community about how we are serving. So these are young people that it's August now and school is approaching. Sorry to mention that. <laughs> There's one girl that's, no, no. Um, and they are giving up one of their last weeks of their summer. No, no. Um, to serve in the name of Jesus. And so I would encourage you to pray for them. Um, it's just awesome that they are here because they are able to multiply what God is doing in this place in this way. So um, that's what I want to tell you. I do want you to stand up again. We're going to shake some hands, meet some people. There are Lots of people that you don't know here right now. So meet at least two of them, okay? Let's stand up and greet each other. Oh yeah, we went, we went from here to Salt Lake City, 1,400 miles with a total of less than half an hour of stops, total. Yeah, well, we wanted to get there, so it was One more night, because we found out that Delta would reimburse our expenses. So we're like, oh. So we should have stayed in like the Hilton or something. That's far. Yeah, that's like two hours from me, I think. But that's a nice area. Did you go to like Garden of the Gods? It's like an Airbnb treehouse thing. That's cool. That's cool.
That's true. Sometimes we have things that we want that aren't yes or amen. But Lord, we know that you are faithful. And Lord, we know that even the things that you say no to are a blessing because Lord, like children, we sometimes want things that um, would not be good for. Sometimes we want things, we cry out for things that it's a blessing that you say no. But Lord, we want this morning to rest in your promises. We want to rest in the promises that you have your hand on the life of Copen. We want to rest in the promises that you have your hand on the lives of Andrew and Kelly and all of us, Lord. We want to rest in the promise that even in a world that feels so sometimes chaotic and difficult to understand and painful and, and confused, Lord, and confusing. We want to rest in the promise that you are God, that you are sovereign. Lord, we want to worship you as God. You are beautiful. You are powerful. You are graceful. You are forgiving. You are the God of the universe. 
And Lord, we worship you for who we are, for who you are. We confess that even this week, Lord, we have not been everything we should be. Lord, we have turned away from you even this week, even this morning. In word and in deed, there have been things that we should have done that we have not done. There have been things that we haven't done or that we have done that we shouldn't have done. Lord, we need you. And Lord, we do want to pray for some specific things this morning. We want to pray for our dear friends, Hank and Cheryl, and for Jane. Lord, we pray that you would watch over them as they're dealing with health challenges. We thank you for the fact that you care, that you are the great physician, that you know even more than modern medicine can ever know about our needs and our struggles and our brokenness physical, emotional, social, spiritual, all of it, Lord. Lord, we want to thank you for the group from Minnesota that's here with the Praying Pelicans. We pray that you would give them productive ministry. We pray that you would watch over them. We pray that you would use them not for their glory, not for our glory, but for your glory. Lord, we thank you that they could be here. We want to pray for the school supplies we've been collecting and for the ministry of Christ Cares. Lord, we pray that you would use that um, and use those pencils and paper and crayons and all that stuff, Lord. We pray that you would use it to, um, to help young people people become educated, but also, Lord, we pray that it would be received as a gift from God. Lord, you have been good for us and good to us. And Lord, we pray that you would pour out your blessing on this church, on this community, on this region, on this country, on this world world. Lord, we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I do want to um, remind some of you that, and many of you don't know this, but as part of communion, we always take a uh, love offering for a specific cause, and this this morning's love offering is for um, supply, right? Supply? Is somebody nod that knows what they're talking about. Okay. Um, supply is a young adult ministry with people from young people from many churches, and they meet almost every Monday night in our gym, and it's a really cool ministry. So, we have an offering that you will have an opportunity to give as you leave. Um, there are baskets over here. You could do it online. And we don't, for those of you that are visitors, actually pass the plate. Um, if you want to give to support the ministry of this church, you're welcome to do that. Although if you're a visitor, I want you to know that you, your presence here is your offering. I don't want you to feel any obligation at all. I want to read to you this morning from the book of Habakkuk. Everybody say Habakkuk. And for those of you who learned to say it this way, everybody say Habakkuk. Okay, let's take a vote. How many of you learned it Habakkuk? How many of you learned it Habakkuk? How many of you have no idea? Okay. Um, but we have been studying this little book which deals with real stuff. And I want to read to you from Habakkuk chapter 3. 
a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigonoth. We don't know what that means, and we don't know how to say it either, so you don't get a vote on that. This is what Habakkuk prays. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens. His praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed in his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Cushion in in distress. The dwellings of Median in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by and deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, you pierced his head. When his warriors streamed out, stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were hiding, you trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. Now, we're going to stop there and pray, and we'll continue later, but let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And to be honest, for every one of us, including myself, there are parts that we're like, Lord, what's that referring to? But Lord, we believe this is your word. Teach us, speak to us this morning, because we are hungry to know you and to know truth. In Jesus' name, amen. As I read this passage, I flash back to last week. Many of you know that I wasn't here this week. Julie and I, well, we went out to Utah to visit our son, Benjamin. And that didn't go the way we planned. Um, We were supposed to fly on Monday of two weeks ago. And we were supposed to fly Delta. Now, if you have followed the news, you know there was this tech outage that made thousands of flights be canceled. Well, most of those or many of those were on Delta. And so we checked in Sunday night and made sure that our flight was on time. It was okay. And after all, the tech outage would be Resolved by Monday morning, right? Well, we got almost all the way to O'Hare on Monday morning, and we realized, oh, we should check, and it was canceled. But, you know, there's more than one flight on Delta to Salt Lake City on a weekday, but that one was canceled, and that one was full, and that one was and Tuesday and Wednesday, and there was a chance that we could get a flight on Thursday. So we decided, spur of the moment, we'll just drive to Utah, which is just like a couple hundred miles, right? And 
22 hours later, we arrived in Salt Lake City at four in the morning after, and I'm, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm bragging here. We drove 1,400 miles with a total of less than half an hour of stops. Yeah, okay. But, um, and we're still married. Um, the reason I tell you that is that isn't life that way sometimes? You have plans, and they are good plans. You have things that you want in your life, and you're like, there's nothing wrong with this. I mean, we're going to visit our son. That's that's a good thing, right? I mean, some of you know Ben. He doesn't wear shoes much. But other than that, he's a good young man. And we're his parents. So... There were moments, especially about two in the morning as we were driving to Utah, which is both beautiful and barren, um, when I was like, why is this so hard? And as we look at this passage of Scripture, I want to tell you one other story about our time out there. We went to Antelope Island, which is in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. So it's a desert island in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. It is dry and barren and, well, it's just not a very pleasant place. Although Spider Fest was going on while we were there. So you got to see literally thousands of spiders crawling free on the island. Anyway, we were at an oasis on Antelope Island. It was hot, it was dry, but it was an oasis. There were trees and there was, a, a, you know, a fountain of, and it was nice, but it was hot. And there was this family at the Oasis Ranch there that had a, a child about two years old. And this was the conversation, generally paraphrased, that I heard. I don't want to walk. Okay, do you want me to carry you? I don't want you to carry me. Okay, do you want to go back to the car? I don't want to leave. Okay, we'll just stay here. I don't want to stay here. Familiar? Anybody? Anybody been there? Now, <laughs> the, the parents with young children are like. <laughs> now, I want to ask you one other question. Have you been there as a parent, or to be honest, have you been there as a child? Have you been the person saying to your parents, or more likely, more recently, to God, God, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want this. You ever felt like none of the options were good options? That's what we see in Habakkuk. Habakkuk sounds like a foreign, kind of crazy sounding name. None of you have a friend named Habakkuk, unless you're Amish, in which case you're welcome. But Habakkuk is not so foreign because he starts out at the beginning of the book and says, God, why? He says, God, why is life like this? Why aren't you doing this? Why are you doing this? Why are people doing this? He's just asking a whole lot of why. And God says, don't worry about it. I'm going to intervene. I'm going to step in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the Babylonians... 
I'm going to use them, those evil, horrible people, I'm going to use them to wake up the Israelites. And, and Habakkuk is like, wait a minute. So you're saying that your people are misbehaving, so you're going to use even worse people. That doesn't sound like a good idea. And what happens in the course of the book is that Habakkuk, after he talks to God and says, God, I don't like this, God gives an answer. Habakkuk says, I don't like that answer. You ever been there? And Habakkuk at the end of that says, okay, God, I'm going to stand here. And you kind of sense that he's crossing his arms and saying, okay, God, what are you going to do? I've told you what you should do. You know, Habakkuk is, is at this point where it sounds like he is saying, okay, God, I know I've explained this to you, so you probably understand it now because I'm so wise. Basically, Habakkuk is having a conversation with God where he starts out saying, God, why? Do you hear? Do you care? Why is the world like this? Are you even there? I mean, we have some middle schoolers sitting here. And one of the givens, one of the absolute truths about middle school is you have days like that. Right? When you're like, I don't like this. I mean, for me, in my mind, middle school was not that bad except for the days that I had to be around other middle schoolers. And especially if there was a girl that I liked, because my life, until I met Julie, my wife, was largely filled with girls whose parents thought I was cute. <laughs> Not helpful. But there are moments that we turn to God and say, God, what's going on? Why do you even care? And from that point, God, well, let's skip to the end of the passage this morning. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Hear this and listen to the change and Habakkuk's attitude. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, he's saying, even if everything is bad and we are on the brink of starvation, he says this, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. How do you get there from God? Do you even care? How do you get from anger and doubt and fear and confusion to faith? Well, look back at verse 2. He says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. You know what he's saying? He's saying, God, I know who you are, and I know what you've done. And I'm going to hold on to that even when I have doubts. See, his situation hasn't changed at all, has it? There's nothing in this book that indicates that, you know, Habakkuk complains and God says, oh, you're right, Habakkuk. 
I'll fix that. No, God says, I have a plan, and Habakkuk doesn't like it. But his attitude changes because he looks back and he remembers what God has done. Now, sometimes we get really mad at how things are going and we haven't really weighed what we deserve. Like, let's say you're at a basketball game and you really care about one team, okay? Here's my team and I am cheering for them and there are some things happening where I'm like, ooh, we got lucky on that call. Our, our star player just take somebody out. I mean, it's a blatant foul. And it doesn't get called. And we're like, whew. Ah, it wasn't that bad anyway. Then, the next time down the court, the other team barely brushes up against us, and it's kind of a borderline foul. So we've gotten away with something huge, and the other team has gotten away with something tiny. What happens in our hearts? We're like, oh, ref, how could you do this? Even though we know that in the long run, the balance is going the other way. Sometimes we get mad about how things are going and we fail to weigh what we really deserve. And so Habakkuk stands back and he looks at life and reality and he realizes God has been kind. So he goes through, and we won't talk about each of these, but he basically says, even the bad stuff, verse 5, God has pegs, plagues and pestilence in his hands. In other words, God's going to use even the bad stuff for his purposes. In verse 6, he says, God is mightier than the mountains. Whatever we face, God is bigger. And then in verse 7, he talks about Cushan and Midian, and Midian, which basically is saying, God is mightier than the nations. So I want to remind you this morning that God is more powerful than whatever you are facing. Do you hear that? God is bigger and more powerful than anything you will face. Not only is he bigger and more powerful, but Jesus came and he walked on this earth and the Bible says he faced all the temptations that we face, which means God is not only good enough and big enough and powerful enough, but it means that God understands. I've had several conversations recently with people even in my own family who are facing declining health and that's hard i mean we were climbing angels landing last week in utah which is this famous amazing thing that I'm stunned that people don't fall and die. <laughs> um, and there are places where there are chains set into the stone so you can climb up to the top. And we got most of the way up and I realized I can't do it anymore. 
many of you know I've had my health stuff in the last couple of years, in the last couple of months, and I realized that I can't do it. And I said, and Julie did it, which that's great. Um, and Benjamin did it. But I watched a father helping his own child about 10 or 11 years old up this. And all of a sudden, as I was sitting there waiting for them to come back, I just began to weep. So I'm like, you know, I used to be the dad who would help my son up the mountain. And I can't do that anymore. You know what the good news is? Jesus has faced suffering and decline, and even death for us in our place. And so whatever you face, God is big enough. And even when everything goes wrong, God says, I've got this. In verse 16, Habakkuk responds. He says, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered with the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. And he goes on and he says, I will trust God. Even if everything else falls apart, I will trust God. Andrew and Kelly, as you raise this child, (laughs) there'll be those days. Do I have an amen from a parent? There will be days that you're like, why did we have children? Those of you that are here with the Pelicans, your parents have never thought that. But all the other parents have thought that. But in the midst of it, he says, I remember what God has done. I remember God's character. The answer doesn't come from God fixing everything. Although in the end of time, that will happen. The answer comes from trusting God in the midst of it all. You ever been around somebody that you used to know well and you haven't seen them in a while? And you're like, I forgot how awesome they were. Or I forgot how kind they were. I, or maybe I forgot how much I didn't like being around them. But the point is, sometimes when we don't intentionally remember we forget what someone is like. This scripture says, Habakkuk is saying, I'm reminding myself, I'm remembering who God is. So, there's so much more we could say here, but I I do want to give you just a couple applications for your lives, for all of our lives. First of all, I want you to know 
that you can bring your questions and your struggles and your pains and your doubts to God. You can come to God and say, God, I don't get it. And God says, I'll walk with you. So that's the first thing. Bring your questions, your struggles, your pains, your doubts. Second thing is, I would challenge you to listen. Habakkuk may have listened this way with his arm crossed, but he was listening. Sometimes, and this happens in marriages sometimes, <laughs> in every marriage sometimes, that you need an answer from your husband or your wife and you don't listen long enough for them to give an answer. And we do that to God too, don't we? God, why? What are you doing? What are you going to do? How are you going to fix this? Why are they like this? Why am I like this? Why is the world like this? God, God, that's my question. Give me an answer. And we run off in the other direction. I want to encourage you to, after you bring your questions to God, listen to his answer. Secondly, thirdly, I want to encourage you to rest in the goodness and power of God. Trust God to be God, even when we don't get it. Trust God to be God. Because the ultimate value of all of this is that God has loved you and me, each of us, so much that he sent his only son to die for us. I mean, many of you I love. I know you already. I love you. And I would get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to go help you if needed. I would do that kind of thing. I would, um, you know, write a check out of my, I hope it's not a big check because there isn't that much money in the account to start with, I, I love you and I would do stuff for you, but there is no one in this room that I would give my child for, period. Sorry. That's the God that we can trust. And that's what happened in Habakkuk's life. He realizes, I can trust God in the midst of the pain and the challenge because God loves me that much. That's why baptism happens. Because if God was not that good, why would we bother? And the other thing I want to say as we move towards baptism and communion is the fact that ultimately we are depending on the grace and love and mercy of God not because we're worthy. I mean, come on, you know yourself. Any of you, do any of us really believe, yeah, I, I live such a great life. God is, God is lucky to have me on his team. Or do we ultimately say, God, just as I am, just as I am, without one plea, 
but that your blood was shed for me. Let's pray. Lord, give us faith in the midst of the darkness. Help us to trust you because you are good. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have two things that we're going to do now. And as we move towards baptism, I do want to acknowledge that um, we have Baptists and Catholics and Lutherans and Reformed people and I don't know, you fill your own category in. And so we have different beliefs about baptism maybe. But as we prepare to baptize Copen Andrew John, right? Is that right, the right order? Okay. Copen Andrew John signs. We need to know that when we do baptism, however we do it, there are four different actors, four different kind of parts in the play. One is God. God is saying, this human being belongs to me. And that's by far the most important thing, right? Then there are the parents that are making the promises, saying, we intend to raise this child in the Lord. Then there are all of you. I don't know if you know this, but you're not a passive observer. You are part of this. Children are not raised by two people in a vacuum. They're raised by family and friends, many of whom aren't here. I mean, there are people that will have a profound impact on Copen that Andrew and Kelly don't even know yet. But God's people, and the fourth actor is Copen, who is the center of it all, but is also kind of the, the passive actor, right? I mean, for those of you that are from a more Baptistic background, you're like, wait, I'm confused. Well, in a lot of ways, it's more complex than this, but think of this partly as a dedica- dedication by Andrew and Kelly. I mean, because Copen is eight months old yesterday, Probably not a deep profession of faith on his part at this point. Um, You know, you might think your kid was smart, but he's not that smart. Um, And I do want to remind you that salvation is not happening here. There's nothing magical that happens In a baptism, it's not like God is waving his wand and saying, there, everything's fine. And yet, there is. The God of the universe is saying, this child is mine. And he's saying to Andrew and Kelly, you're not alone. I am with you and these people. Are with you. So I want to invite Andrew and Kelly and um, and Copen and John, the grandfather, who's an elder at this church, is also going to stand with them. And I want to invite you guys up now. So while they come up. 
I want to remind you that baptism is the sign and seal of God's promises to his covenant people. In baptism, God makes a promise that his grace is real and available. God promises that there is grace enough for Copen, who, let's face it, doesn't look like he needs grace right now, does he? But God says, I, I have paid for this child's sin. And there will come a day when Copen, we pray, will say, yeah, I want that. I need that. This promise is made visible in the water of baptism. Water cleanses, it purifies, it sustains. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the living water. Through baptism, Christ calls us to new obedience to love and trust God completely, to forsake the evil of the world and to live a new and holy life. Yet when we fall into sin, we must not continue to sin, for baptism is the sign and seal of God's eternal covenant of grace. So, Andrew and Kelly, I want to ask you a couple questions. Before God and Christ's church, do you renounce evil and Satan? Do you profess your faith in Christ Jesus? And do you confess the faith of the church as parents? And who do you trust for salvation and everything you need? Do you trust Jesus? Okay. Um, I want to ask all of you, um, and I want you to stand. Let's stand and do this. Even if you don't know these people, we are part of the family of God. And we have a role. In this child and in every child that we ever meet in our lives. So, do you promise to love, encourage, and support this brother and sister and all who enter on this journey by teaching the gospel of God's love by being an example of Christian faith and character and giving the strong support of God's family in fellowship, prayer, and service? If so, respond with, we do. Let's pray. Lord, as we baptize this child, we realize that we are dependent on you that Andrew and Kelly are dependent on you, that all of us need your grace. We are all on some level as helpless as an infant. And we need you in our lives. We pray that you would bless this child, that you would bless these parents, and that you would enable him early in life to know your grace, not as the faith of his parents, but as the faith that you have placed in his heart. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Can you step up and here, let me, uh, let me, hey, buddy. (laughs) 
He's so beautiful. Copen Andrew John Signs, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. that. Is that a good thing? I don't know if there are many greater proofs in the world of the existence of God than the fact that this little person, we talked about this yesterday, grew inside of his mom. And came out so beautiful. There you go. Let's pray again. Lord, we thank you for your promise. We thank you for faith. And we thank you that even when we fail, you are good and you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's let's give him a hand, and let's let's give God a hand, because He is faithful. Now we have one other thing we need to do, and as we plan this service, we're like, "Wow, there's a lot going on," but we need to do one more very important thing this morning, because. We are going to celebrate communion together. And I tell you, it's appropriate that we do these things together. Because we have just talked about the grace of God and the faithfulness of God. And even as we look at a beautiful child... We then need to turn our eyes back to the one who made faith possible. You see, it's not just about a commitment. It's about the fact that ultimately God understands that we are broken. Anybody here broken? And we need each other, and deeper than that, we need Jesus. God has provided the solution for everything that's overwhelming, everything that we fail at. And so Jesus lived and died for us. When we come to the table, we come to the table recognizing that we're remembering what Jesus did. We come to the table recognizing that it's something we do as the family of God. And we realize that we come to the table with our eyes on the future. Habakkuk says, even though everything falls apart, I will trust God. And there will come a day when we shall partake, when his kingdom has fully come, when with unveiled face we behold him and we will be made
on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered, and I think that's important, it wasn't just Jesus, it was Jesus and his people. We do this together, just as we baptize together, as we learn together. Jesus said, on the day that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper... He took the cup and said, this cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. If you have made a profession of your faith in Jesus Christ, if you are trusting Jesus for your salvation, you are invited to the table. And you might not know this, but historically, communion was not always something that people did after they've kind of made it official. There are, there's a great tradition in Christianity of people coming and the communion table being kind of a profession of faith. So if you are trusting Jesus for your salvation, if you realize you're broken and you need him to make you new, then you are invited to the table. The way this is going to work, the way we do this this morning, is I'm going to invite some elders forward, and they are going to distribute the elements, and um, there will be a tray that will come by you, and it will have both cups of juice and cups of bread, which some of you may not have seen before. But uh, um, we ask you to take um, a, a cup, one of each, and then hold that, and we will partake together after everyone has been served. I invite the elders to come. Everything is ready.
as we take this, I want to remind you that Jesus is the answer. Parenting is hard, but Jesus is enough. Life is difficult, but Jesus is enough. Each of us is broken and needy. And praise God, Jesus is enough. The bread which we break is the communion of the blood. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Lord, thank you. We are reminded this morning, even as we sing this last song, Lord, we are reminded that you bring life. You bring life in the middle of struggle. You bring hope in the middle of doubt. You bring faith in the middle of darkness. You bring light when we are alone. Lord, we acknowledge that you are the answer that you, by your blood, paid for our sin, purchased us, and made available to each of us salvation and a real personal relationship with the God of the universe. Lord, we thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name. Search the world.
that's better than you. The worship service ends now, but it doesn't end because God calls us out. Um, I want to remind you that if you're from this church and you've brought school supplies for Christ Cares, there are boxes back here, and I've been told that if you bring school supplies tomorrow, we'll still get them there. Um, also, next Sunday, please hear this, we are worshiping on the front steps together with Kingdom Ministries, and it's at 10 o'clock. Current weather forecast next Sunday is 70 degrees and sunny at 10 o'clock. So praise the Lord. Um, there's going to be, we're going to be grilling some meat afterwards. Um, we're also going to, I haven't told my wife this yet, but we're going to make some famous Morris homemade ice cream for that day. Um, and so 10 o'clock, everybody say 10 o'clock. Okay, if you're a visitor this morning, you're welcome. So, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore, and all God's people said, go in peace.